Yeah, I'm glad you guys are talking about the economy. It's, it's been kind of a, a pet peeve of mine, actually. Um, a lot of talk about economics at a time when our, our world is, is faced with, with climate change. Um, and so I guess my questions are to both the, both of the candidates there is, one, if they, if they believe that climate change is actually an issue, and two, if they feel like that it is within the scope of city council at all to involve itself in binding or non-binding resolutions having to do with um, issues like the Alberta tar sands and other real carbon-intensive um, economies that uh, actually are destroying the future of the, the children of this earth. Okay, and that question will go to Art Betke first, or, or a slew of questions, I guess. <laughs> I'll try to hit as many as I remember. But yeah, climate change is, is a, real, a real thing that's going on. And I'm not sure how large a role a municipality like Moscow in North Idaho can necessarily play in larger global political arenas. But what we can do is set an example in our own selves by sitting here and trying to do what we can to encourage, for example, uh, utilization of our agricultural products that are right here around our town. Why are we bringing in uh, processed foods from far, far away when we're surrounded by wheat? Why don't we make our own cereals here? Why not take advantage of that industrial park? and do some of that, make uh, decrease the amount of transport that we have to do to get our agricultural goods, uh, just produce the stuff locally. Uh, there's other things we can do uh, just by way of trying to encourage urban agriculture here in town as well. And that's something that we've recently accomplished on planning and zoning, to encourage people to grow their own food in their own backyard. And that was Art Betke and now John Weber. I, <clears throat> I agree with Art that I do believe that we've got some climate change going on. I don't think that uh, it is a uh, uh, something that uh, is yet to be decided. I think it has been decided. Um, I don't know that we as a city can have much of an effect uh, on ag actually what happens uh, in Canada. And I don't know that we uh, actually should have any uh, any effect on that, we can uh, make a statement saying that we are either for something or against something. But as far as making it a binding uh, uh, statement, I don't think we can do that. And as far as uh, trying to increase the amount of local products that are produced locally and used locally, uh, I think that's a great idea. And I think we can uh, use the uh, uh, information and uh, the skills that we have locally um, through the uh, agriculture uh, community to okay. help with that process. All right. Well, I'll do a follow-up. Um, this is uh, KRFP Moscow, uh, 892-9200, if you have questions for these candidates. Uh, this will go to our, uh, excuse me, John Weber next. And uh, do you expect... Uh, a influx of climate refugees in this area in future decades and uh, how would the city deal with that i couldn't even begin to address that question i have uh, uh i don't have any personal experience in the geography of the situation and uh i think if we do end up with them in future generations uh since this is moscow I think that the future generations will deal with them and as, as well as they can. I, uh, I, I can't say much more than that. Okay, that was John Weber, now Art Betke. I think the possibility does exist that we might see an influx of people. Uh, from climate projections I've seen, the Palouse is destined to become more like a California climate, and California's probably headed the ways of a Sahara Desert or something equally unpleasant. So I think we would see some people coming up this direction over the next 30 to 50 years. Problem is, what do we do with them and how do we support them without uh, bringing ourselves into the same issues that Southern California suffers right now? Things like water shortage. Where are we going to find the water for a bunch of new people who come into town? Also, how do we accommodate uh, the housing, the roads, the bike paths, things like that? What do we do for all of those issues? 
And Moscow has been blessed with slow, steady growth all these years. And trying to accommodate a rapid increase could be very, very difficult for us all. That was Art Betke. The phone number is 892-9200. The next question will go to Art Betke, candidate for city council. And uh, we've got a caller on line one. So, KRFP, you're on the air. All right. Hello. So, hi. Uh, I'm Paul McPoland. I work with uh, Wild Idaho Rising Tide. And I kind of wanted to follow up the previous caller's comments a little bit. Um, if either of you guys was to find yourself on city council, um, could we expect your support in um, stopping some of these megaloads from coming up Highway 95? As you may, as you may know, um, we had a couple loads sneak through town just last week. And uh, they're obviously on their way to the Alberta tar sands operation, which uh, the world's top environmental scientists have have stated numerous times that if that operation uh, if that operation goes into effect and, and is finished, uh, then the the climate is finished for. For the for the planet, and basically, uh, we have no no air to breathe, no water to drink, and um, so so. What would you see your role as as um, what would you see what would you see your role in the ability to to stop these loads from heading up 95? or Highway 12, for that matter. Thanks for your call. We'll go to Art Betke first. A thorny question, for sure. Um, everybody has a right to protest as they see fit. Um, and the problem starts to come into the intersection between protest and legally allowed transportation of goods. I think US 95 is got to be less of an issue than Highway 12. Highway 12 is a twisty, windy road alongside a wild and scenic river that goes through a, the Indian Reservation, and they've expressed their dismay at this going on. I think that may not be the best way to get goods back and forth across the mountains. However, US 95, being a US highway, has been designated that way for transportation of goods and people from one point to another. And I think there's very little that can be done from Moscow's point of view to prohibit or hinder the transport of megaloads up through town on US 95. So we may be uh, limited in what the city itself can do. That was Art Betke and now John Weber. I hate to say this, but Art covered that about as well as I could cover, possibly better. Um, there's not much we can do. Uh, the Idaho Department of Transportation uh, gives out uh, the permits, and it is a uh, U.S. highway. It goes through Moscow, and I don't see any way that we could actually stop it uh, within uh, the legal confines of the city and the things that we can do. Uh, as far as Highway 12 goes, uh, that happens in another county, two counties away. It happens on an Indian reservation, and we, as the city of Moscow, uh, have no authority and probably would have no effect one way or the other, even if we were to voice an opinion. And that was John Weber, candidate for Moscow City Council. We have two candidates running for Moscow City Council in the studios right now. Uh, Art Bedke and John Weber. There are four candidates this year. The other two candidates are Rebecca Rod and uh, Walter Steed. And uh, voters can vote for up to three candidates when Election Day comes or if you vote in advance at the courthouse during uh, business hours up until November 1st. The election itself is November 5th. And uh, we're taking calls, 892-9200. Um, I have a question right now, and this will go to uh, John Weber first. We heard at the Palouse Basin Water Summit uh, from uh, Moscow City Public Works Director Les McDonald about a water rate study saying we have to increase water rates in the city because of infrastructure needs. 
what sort of policy should the city have in ensuring there's enough drinking water in the long term? I think that, uh, well, I know this, that the water rates are, that's a dedicated fund. And so all of the money that uh, the citizens pay for their water goes into a fund to uh, not only keep the system as it is going, but to repair it uh, in the future. And uh, by using the water that we're using and uh, maintaining the system and fixing the system, I think it is going to go up. I think the cost is going to go up. I don't see any way that it cannot. And as far as uh, uh, reducing the uh, quantity that is used by the city, I think it would be a very good idea to make sure that our uh, people are well-informed about not using a lot of water, not using water that they don't need to use, but uh, I can't see myself being in favor of restricting uh, water use. That was John Weber, and now Art Betke. Yeah, I think the main thrust of this question is where are we going to get water for the future, seeing as we're pulling off of a declining fossil aquifer with an eventually limited amount of water in it? And so I think there's several approaches. One that's being accomplished very well is through conservation in this town. The amount of water used per capita has decreased steadily here, but you can only con conserve so far before you absolutely run out of things. What you're left with is trying to find other sources, and I'm thinking that perhaps something like within city limits catchment bases, basins to take care of some spring runoff and snow melt and use that for part of the year to help take some of the pressure off the aquifer would be one thing. Eventually, we're going to have to uh, examine the putting a reservoir up on the mountain and piping the water on down into town in order to just uh, sustain any growth that's going on. And the other thing we can do is work with other municipalities in the area to see what we can do to uh, get them to reduce their use of the aquifer as well. And that was City Council candidate Art Betke and City Council candidate John Weber is here. And I do believe we have another caller on the line. So, nope, that uh, caller hung up. Uh, they were calling on the business line, so maybe the, uh, they had some other business. Anyway, um, we're, we'll, we've got another call here, so let's try this one. KRFP, you are on the air. Hi. Just, just to let you know, I'm, oh, let me turn my radio down. <laughs> um, I'm not the caller who was playing before. I just uh, wondered what the candidates would consider. I see possibly the need of raising the water rate so significantly to... Uh, pay for the infrastructure and the new well they want to put in and all that. But um, what about a tiered uh, um, water rate that would the super water users, the people who water their yard every night, a lot more for that extra water, which would not enforce but encourage conservation? I'd like to hear we both candidates comment on that. Okay, we'll go to Art Betke first on that. Yeah, I like that idea rather a lot because I see some people with emerald green lawns while mine is a lovely shade of dead brown. And I think uh, we have a tiered system in place now, but I think it may not be a steep enough tiered rate to really discourage very much water use. And I would uh, like to see uh, that slope of increase uh, made up a little bit higher. So super users are going to pay a lot more and as in essence help subsidize those who are very conservative with their water use. And I think that would, one, provide a means to limit water use and depletion of the aquifer and get the city's uh, goals accomplished. Yeah. That was Art Betke and now John Weber. I too uh, have a brown lawn. I don't uh, water my lawn at all during the year and I don't know whether that's because I don't like to mow it or that <laughs> I don't like, I, I don't want to use too much water. Um, I uh, agree that uh, paying for water to keep your lawn very green, uh, paying more is, is, is a good idea. However, if we are going to do that, I think the city should uh, fall under the same uh, rules and uh, maybe not water uh, a lot of the city parks and uh, things like that that they uh, manage to keep as green as possible 
Uh, that might cause more of a problem 